Can you hear the sound? Can you hear the sound? You're very echoey. Okay.
So we have to start. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on the International House Party. My name is Dua Malibari and I'm serving as a graduate assistant for the International Student Resource Center in the Office of uh, Multicultural Service and Program. Today we have uh, a new country and uh, this is our uh, gonna be the last session for uh, the fall and uh, uh, the presenter will be Olivia. So before we start, I will read the land acknowledgement statement. Uh, it says, we want to acknowledge that we gather in traditional land of uh, Delaware, Kickapoo, Miami, Bound Builders, and Biancosho, uh, Betuami, uh, and uh, Shawnee, and we. The we were Miami, Illinois, originally located in Western Indiana. They were part of the large Illinois con uh, confed uh, Confederation. People past and present and honor with the gratitude the land itself and the people who have stu uh, stewarded uh, throughout the generation. This is called us to commit to continue to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabited as well. And as you see, uh, this is the we tribe uh, at Terre Haute. It's located in the Firebank Parks. So, Olivia, are you ready to share your screen? Yes, I am. Great. Um, all right, so let me just share my screen first. So, oh, there we go. Okay. So my name is Olivia, hello, and I'm an international student from Denmark, um, and I'm a freshman, so I actually just got here uh, this December, uh, and you know now I'm doing this presentation about Denmark and Danish culture, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, and then if you guys have any questions at the end, you know, I'll be uh, open to questions and have time for questions as well. Um, so yeah, and then we have Denmark and then this beautiful picture of uh, uh, Copenhagen, a specific street that's very famous for these very colorful houses. I'm sure you guys have seen it before. So, yep. Uh, so a little introduction to Denmark and what Denmark is as a country. Uh, so uh, Denmark, the name uh, comes uh, from generally two places. So uh, the sort of myth surrounding the Denmark and why the country is called Denmark uh, is the legend of the King of Dan, who was um, one of the early kings of Denmark. He was a Viking king. And, uh, and that basically the country was named after him because he uh, won a great war and then he sort of united the country um, uh, along with some parts of Sweden and Norway. Uh, and then uh, we also have this thing, uh, or then, but even before that, where the name probably most likely comes from is because the people were called the Danny um, a long time ago. So, land, so Denmark, if you break it down, means land of the Danny. So that's most likely where it comes from, but there's also the sort of the King Dan myth. Um, Another little interesting fact is that uh, these two big stones that you see in the picture are rune stones uh, and they are what we call the baptismal certificate of Denmark. Uh, so they're sort of, uh, they were raised by uh, the first king of Denmark actually. And that's sort of where we recognize as a Danish people sort of the start of Denmark as a united country. Um, Denmark is a very small country. It's uh, uh, 16,580 square miles uh, all together. So there's not a lot. Um, and uh, the population is about 5.8 million, which is approximately 0.07% of the world's population. So there are not a lot of Danish people in the world, particularly because the country is so small. Um, so that's very cool. Uh, and then 89% of the people who live in Denmark consider themselves 
ethnic Danish. Uh, and then we have 11% others. So we're not very culturally diverse as a country whatsoever. Uh, we do have a lot of immigrants uh, in the country. Um, but other, it's particularly from the Middle East. But other than that, you know, it's mostly Danish, very white all across. <laughs> um, so coming to America, it's definitely very different where every word so ethnically diverse. Uh, and also, you know, it's one of the happiest countries in the world. We were ranked number one, uh, but I think that one's gone to Finland now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so also another very interesting fact. And then we have a map of Denmark down here. Uh, and if anyone's curious, I lived right here in the middle. It's not in the middle, but in the south middle of the main peninsula, which is called Jylland or Jutland, however you want to pronounce it. And then this is Sjælland, the big island with uh, the capital, which is Copenhagen. Uh, let's see if I can switch slides. And then we have a big map of the world with Denmark outlined. So Denmark is this little bit right here that's right above uh, Germany and below Norway and Sweden. Uh, and then this is Greenland, of course, and these are the Faroe Islands. And they're not Denmark, but they are a part of uh, the Danish kingdom. Uh, so while they are technically uh, free governing states, uh, they do rely on Denmark for uh, social justice system and, and uh, various uh, uh, financial uh, aids and whatnot. Uh, their schooling is primarily Danish. They learn Danish in their schools, um, but they're a completely different people, obviously. Um, yeah. Uh, and culturally, where the Danish really stem from, which is very interesting, is, is the Vikings. You know, and there are a lot of uh, very <laughs> uh, common conceptions about Vikings and Vikinghood. Um, but uh, Vikings were really just a rural people. Uh, so they dressed, you know, you can see an image right here. Uh, they dressed, you know, uh, comfortably and, and sort of conveniently, you know, because they were uh, uh, peasants and, and workers in the field. Um, but there are also sailors and, uh, and, and a lot of other things. They were very uh, sort of uh, diverse and, and sort of had a lot of skills. Uh, they were fishermen, they were, they were craftsmen, they were, you know, farmers, a lot of things. Um, and obviously, they be, they believed Norse mythology uh, for a long time, uh, and um, but then in the eleventh and between the eleventh and tenth century, Christianity was introduced in Denmark, um, and the Vikings became Christian, and that's sort of where we have most the majority of Viking history uh, is from a Chris, Christian perspective, because the Vikings didn't write a lot of things down. Um, and then, of course, in the 16th century, uh, Lutheranism sort of became the big thing. Uh, so that means that now uh, we're a Protestant nation. It is the main religion in Denmark. Um, uh, and that's, there. we have a lot of, and not a lot of people are religious in Denmark, but it's sort of the cultural norm that, uh, that everybody is, is sort of Protestant or and have some sort of connection to the church in some way. People get married in churches typically and, and people typically get baptized and whatnot. Um, and then some very interesting things about the Vikings. Uh, women uh, had a lot of political freedoms actually. Uh, they were sort of, they were not considered the head of the house, uh, but they were considered, um, but, but they were considered, <laughs> But they were considered um, uh, the in charge of the house. They were in charge of uh, rearing children and of of cleaning and 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 that's sort of where the men really didn't get to decide a lot of things. The men were in charge of the economics typically, uh, and while the women were typically involved in uh, the men's work as well, uh, they were of course the head. But the women had full say in rearing of children and of taking care of the home and 
and typically of cooking as well. Um, and those political freedoms, uh, they were also free to divorce actually. So uh, married women, if they didn't like their husbands or were mistreated by their husbands, they were free to get divorced as well. And that's sort of a thing that went away uh, when Christianity sort of came in um, and women became a lot more restricted in uh, also the Viking society, even though they previously had had a lot of freedoms. And these freedoms are, are things that, are, that, don't, that aren't really mentioned anymore in 13th century when we round that the women just don't have those freedoms anymore. Uh, and then another interesting thing is Halblaten is the first king of Denmark uh, from uh, the year 965. And he's also the guy who uh, raised the, the baptismal certificate um, in honor of his mother and father. Um, yep. Uh, Another interesting thing is our flag called Denepo. Um, and it's actually the oldest national flag in the world. And it's uh, this very, it's on this very bright red background uh, with the white uh, cross in the middle, very typical Scandinavian flag. Um, and it's been around at least since the 16th century, this flag, uh, so very old national flag. Um, and the big Danish myth and why this flag is really interesting is uh, because it's actually said to have fallen from the heavens uh, during the Battle of uh, Lindenes, uh, which was a place in Estonia, um, during uh, the one of the many Danish uh, conquests um, in uh, the year 1219 on the 15th of June. Uh, it's said to have just fallen from the sky and sort of to have been bestowed upon the Danish by God. And it was sort of uh, a sign to basically tell, tell the Danes to keep fighting and to be brave Christian men, I suppose. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, legend obviously goes that they won the, the battle and um, then took the flag home and, and then it became the, the flag of Denmark. Um, but it, the flag has appeared uh, before this, before that date, obviously, um, in like uh, art and whatnot. So it's definitely older, but it's not particularly very well known where it exactly originates from. Um, like I said, uh, Denmark is a kingdom. It is a constitutional monarchy, which means that we actually have a queen and uh, a uh, a, uh, what's it called, a uh, royal family, sort of similar to England. Um, and um, obviously we were a monarchy uh, before that. And then in 1849, uh, we sort of had the present uprisings and so sort of the introduction of, uh, of the common peoples uh, having more access to uh, to schooling and having uh, sort of literacy became more common. And so we had the peasant uprising and unconstitutional monarchy was uh, introduced. Uh, so that means that we're a democratic country and that the monarchy doesn't really have any power. It's sort of just um, a token power. So the queen still stamps our laws, <laughs> uh, but she can't really say no, obviously, if it's sort of decided by our democratic parties. Um, and then within that, uh, obviously, once again, Greenland and the Faroe Islands are a part of the Kingdom of Denmark. Um, and um, another really interesting thing is that uh, Denmark, uh, while being a very small country, uh, actually has a lot of uh, sort of political grounding and we're sort of an important country within Europe. Uh, we're founding members of both EU and NATO. <laughs> so. Um, so that's really cool uh, and sort of a way to demonstrate that, uh, that we sort of have a political say and, and, a, and a political circle, uh, which is really cool for such a small country, I think, um, because you could maybe imagine that, you know, such a country doesn't really have a lot of say in uh, political world matters. Um, and then there's also a picture of the, uh, the crown, the, the royal crown, 
and this is actually on display in the in the National Museum Museum in Copenhagen. Uh, so that's really cool. If you guys ever visit, you can go see it. Um, Copenhagen is the capital of Denmark, and it is very well known for its canals. It is obviously a uh, harbor city. Um, and so you'll see a lot of canals running through the city and a lot of sort of boat traffic. Um, and a really popular thing is uh, to sort of take canal trips uh, and you can see the Little Mermaid and, and other various things throughout uh, Copenhagen on these trips. So that's really cool. Uh, and uh, then we're very well known for bicycles because it, you know, it's kind of hard to get around in big cities with cars. So we have a really bicycle friendly uh, city with huge bicycle lanes, uh, sort of as you can see on this picture. Uh, <laughs> and there are a lot of them, a lot of bicycles. Uh, that's sort of a big impression that people who usually visit Copenhagen say that Denmark's got a lot of bicycles and it's not just in Copenhagen. Uh, bicycles are very common. I have a bicycle as well because I can't go without it. Um, Yes, The Little Mermaid is from Denmark. It's uh, actually a tale by Hans Christian Andersen, who is a uh, Danish um, kids story writer. Like, yeah, he did a lot of tales. He also did the, uh, the Ugly Duckling and a lot of other, <laughs> other tales, yeah. So there's a, The Little Mermaid is sort of a statue commencing his uh, stories, yep. So that's very cool. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure there's also actually a Hans Christian Andersen Museum in Copenhagen. So that's also very interesting uh, if anybody wants to see that sometime. Uh, and then of course, uh, since, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> uh, since uh, Denmark sort of was a monarchy, there are also a lot of very huge gardens uh, and castles and whatnot that have been raised by Denmark's, you know, many kings and, and queens and whatnot throughout history. Um, and and they're all be, the, and the majority of them are open to the public uh, for free. So you can walk around, see the pretty flowers and, and the gardens and, and whatnot. So that's really cool. Um, Danish national, uh, we have, <laughs> Uh, every, every country sort of has things that are, you know, their national bird, their national flower. Uh, so the Danish national flower is the daisy, which I actually did not know, but figured out when I was making this. <laughs> so that's very cool. Um, and our Danish national burn, bird is the swan. Um, and uh, then our national dish is uh, this this dish over here, which is called... Um, uh, stick flisk med basilisauts <laughs> and it's essentially just uh, sort of uh, cuts of pork that are fried quite heavily on a pan and then uh, boiled potatoes with a uh, parsley gravy so that's it's very lovely very nice um, very typical Danish uh, food and then we have our na national anthem uh, and our national sport is soccer, if, if anybody was interested in that as well. Uh, the Danish national anthem, we actually have two. We're a very particular country. Usually countries have uh, a single national anthem, uh, but Denmark actually has two. And so the first, the original national anthem uh, was uh, adopted in 1780. And it's also one of the oldest national anthems in the world, not the oldest, but one of them. And it was uh, written as a part of a play that was supposed to honor uh, sailors uh, that had uh, helped the Danish army during the wars with Sweden between the 17th and 18th century. Uh, and it was, and it sort of uh, is, is this uh, very uh, big national anthem that sort of honors Denmark as a country and sort of belittles the other countries for not, for being less, essentially. <laughs> um, so in uh, 1890, uh, a new national anthem was actually written because Denmark had just lo lost Norway uh, and Norway sort of had become an independent country, which was a huge time in Denmark. Uh, 
Uh, and so, or it was a huge period in Denmark and it sort of led to this uh, nationalistic period where instead of looking out and sort of having these uh, ideas of conquest and a, and a grand nation, we started to look within Denmark and, and what we can offer as a people and as a country and ourselves. Um, and so that's what this, the new national anthem basically is. And it was an attempt to steer away from national, international animosity and all that. Uh, and it essentially just praises Danish nature and Danish culture uh, for, for being great in itself. Um, and these, these are both used still. Uh, the, the old one is mainly used in connection to the royal family. And the new one is mostly used in terms of like sporting events and whatnot. So that's the one that our sports team will sing. And I actually have a video of that right here which is really cool because we're very well known in the sports scene for singing our national anthem really well and really loud so that they'll end up turning the music off. So that it's just, just the people in the audience singing, which is really cool. So if I can figure out how to share my sound really quickly. All right. I hope this worked. Did that work? So yeah, that's our national anthem. Very cool. Um, yeah. Oh, wait, let's see if I can. Okay. And sort of, uh, you know, hopping off of the whole bit about our national anthem. Uh, since it does praise Danish nature, I thought I would talk about it for a little bit. Uh, Denmark is sort of very flat and uh, the majority of Denmark is uh, fields and just used in general for various kinds of agriculture. Um, and, uh, but we also have a lot of forests. 13% uh, of our country uh, is forested and that's something we're very proud of, even though it's not necessarily a lot, it sort of is a lot for us as a country uh, particularly when we're so small. Um, and uh, it's also something that we've been making sure to keep that 13% so that that doesn't get lowered. So we actually have a policy in Denmark that if you uh, cut down a tree, you essentially have to plant a new one, um, which is very cool. Um, and <laughs> going off of Denmark being flat, the highest point in Denmark is called Mülleheit, and uh, it's only 170 meters or 560 feet above sea level. So, <laughs> and that is the absolute highest point in Denmark. Uh, so that's not a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously Denmark is surrounded by a lot of water. So we have absolutely gorgeous beaches, um, which is really cool, a lot of fields. Um, and another fun fact is that we're actually uh, a massive producer of Christmas trees. Um, so Germany and England <laughs> will sort of swoop in and uh, buy as many Christmas trees as they can because the Danish Christmas tree is sort of, you know, the end all be all of Christmas trees um, in Europe particularly. So that's really cool. Did I skip one? Wait, I can't figure it out. Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, Danish foods. 
Um, so uh, the majority of Danish cuisine is rooted in uh, peasant dishes. Uh, so we eat a lot of uh, sort of roots, uh, tubers, potatoes, um, beets, uh, carrots, all of those things um, that are easy and cheap to produce and that are quite hearty as well. Um, and uh, we particularly eat a lot of pork, a lot of grain as well. Um, uh, so uh, we also have, <laughs> sorry, we also have uh, sort of uh, this particular kind of bread, which is called rye bread. And rye bread is not what you guys call rye bread. It is uh, sort of this very dense sourdough bread uh, where you have uh, cut rye uh, grains that are sort of soaked uh, or boiled for a, for a long time and then sort of baked into this square bread. Um, and it's really dark and, and really nice. <laughs> and it's my absolutely favorite type of bread in the whole world. Um, and it's very hearty because uh, that's sort of the whole point in Preston dishes that they have to be hearty and uh, and 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 sort of give out be very energy rich and energy dense. Um, another thing about uh, Danish cuisine is that it has a lot of international influence, and that once again comes with sort of that whole Viking culture. That because the Vikings were so all over the world, they were able to bring back uh, a lot of various spices and and new food uh, cultures back to Denmark. And, and that can be seen throughout history with the presence of cardamom and black pepper and nutmeg and cinnamon in our dishes and in our baking and, and whatnot, uh, which is really cool. So, so that international influence is, is really important. Um, and uh, sort of when you think of Denmark, typically people think of the Danish, sort of the, the pastry uh, and actually, <laughs> the Danish doesn't necessarily have much to do with the Denmark uh, because they were not developed in Denmark or anything. Uh, it, it was actually um, a uh, type of baking that was brought back to Denmark by Austrian bakers. Um, and like it's sort of a baking technique that they brought back. And, uh, and a lot of Austrian bakers sort of came to Denmark uh, for work and uh, and this Dan and this pastry that sort of became known as the Danish, uh, sort of really should be credited to these Austrian bakers and, and this Austrian tradition of these flaky pastries, um, and but we sort of just you know incorporated them in our culture and you can find these pastries basically in any bakery, on any street corner in Denmark. They're very common. Um, uh, usually fresh made. Uh, so they've been thoroughly incorporated in our culture, but they're not necessarily Danish. <laughs> um, another really big thing is uh, sort of new Nordic cuisine, new Nordic cuisine, which is this very new food movement that we have in Denmark, uh, which sort of uh, is meant to revolutionize food and how we look at it and sort of turn it into art. Uh, so we have a restaurant in Denmark that is actually considered the world's best. Um, I think it was nominated that a couple of years back, uh, which sort of has inspiration, takes inspiration from this new Nordic cuisine and sort of uh, developing a new type of, of food uh, that is rooted in old traditional passion dishes still, but that are uh, supposed to look like art instead. So besides the potatoes up here, you can see an example of new Nordic cuisine. It's very cool. Um, uh, and then another big thing in Denmark is smapel. Uh, they're sort of open-faced sandwiches uh, that are sort of very neatly decorated. Um, <laughs> a lot of people think that that's just how we eat in Denmark, which is not necessarily the case. Um, they're very like fancy smapel. Usually we just eat open-faced sandwiches in general. Um, but but smaple particularly are usually for like lunch parties and whatnot, or or they can also be found in bakeries and, and lunch places uh, typically uh, on the street and whatnot. Um, so that's very cool. Uh, more 
Danish food, uh, once again, international uh, inspiration <laughs> with sort of uh, the curry dish right here. Um, and, and this is sort of, you know, we eat a lot of bread with sort of just things on top, open space sandwiches. Um, my favorite Danish food, uh, that's a really hard one. That's a really difficult one. Uh, <laughs> I actually put this one on here, the 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 one with the mashed potatoes and the, and the brown sauce, and that is uh, what we call hearts in cream. So they're pork hearts in cream uh, in a sort of a cream sauce gravy with mashed potatoes, and that was my favorite Danish food for a very very long time. Um, so that would probably be my answers now still. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, find what? <laughs> oh, the dish. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> uh, I'd, I've never like had it at a restaurant or anything. It's always uh, sort of been a homemade thing, you know, but if anybody wants a recipe, I'm sure I can send you one, you know. <laughs> All right. And don't uh, forget you are our master chef. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sending more recipes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we have two desserts over here, which is sort of a raw apple uh, cake dessert. And uh, and then below that, we have quote, quote, uh, which is sort of a fun Danish tongue twister that we love having foreigns try and say. Um, and it's essentially just a, a strawberry, uh, great, uh, sorry, strawberry like pudding type of thing uh, that we put cream on, which is really cool. It's very delicious. Everything on here is very delicious, even though it might not look, you know, particularly fancy. <laughs> um, the Danish language, it's a, it's a old Norse language. Um, and uh, we actually have uh, 29 letters in our alphabet instead of 26. Because uh, we have three extras, which is a, u, and o, um, and those obviously come from uh, Old Norse. And um, and a really interesting thing about the Danish language is that uh, we have a thing that's called mutual intelligibility with Norway and Sweden because they sort of uh, originate uh, from the same Old Norse languages, um, which were languages spoken. Um, you know, during the early Viking, Viking uh, eras. Um, so that essentially just means that uh, a Danish person speaking Danish can typically be understood by a no Norwegian or Swedish person uh, without having to sort of translate or, or anything. You could just speak Danish and they will typically understand you. And the same goes the other way around. Now, <laughs> uh, Norwegians surveys, survey says are typically better at understanding both the Danish and Swedish. And both the Danes and Swedish understand Norwegian better um, than they do each other. So that's very interesting that Norwegians sort of are better at that. <laughs> um, but obviously that sort of mutual intelligibility is sort of uh, declining, has been declining. A lot of uh, Danish youth in particular have difficulties understanding both Norwegian and Swedish, particularly if they have not been very exposed to it. So maybe that's something that's only now and that's sort of going to disappear as the languages develop. But uh, as it is right now, the languages are historically close enough to still be able to understand each other, even though they are classified as different languages. Um, Danish writing actually was not standardized until the 16th century um, during uh, sort of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, before that, we used German and Latin as writing and Danish was spoken, it just was not written. Uh, because Christianity obviously introduced Latin as the written language and German was just, you know, right there below us and, and sort of was a very important influence. Um, 
And obviously those languages were still used in writing, but uh, from the 16th century and onwards, Danish writing sort of became more and more prevalent. Um, uh, foreign languages, once again, are really important. Foreign influences in general are really important. Uh, a lot of Danish kids will learn English uh, and then, or every Danish kid will learn English and then another language. Uh, so typically you start in, uh, I started at least in fourth grade uh, with the first second language, uh, <laughs> which was English. And uh, then in uh, se seventh grade, you typically started uh, your second, second language. Uh, however, this was actually recently changed. So now they start in, in first grade with English and in fourth grade, I believe, with German. Um, but the thing about that is with your second uh, foreign language is that you can, you can choose another language. So a lot of schools will also offer Spanish and French um, because those are also very important languages. And you will typically uh, be sort of tied to two foreign languages for a very long time throughout your Danish education. Um, and if, if you look at this little image right here, uh, this is actually uh, the uh, requirements for a philosophy degree in Denmark, if you wanna go to university and study philosophy, it is requiring you to have a, um, a, for, a, a second foreign language if you want to, to get, upset, uh, get accepted. Uh, and, <laughs> Um, so it's not really a thing that you can get around and that's, um, sort of common with a lot of universities that they will require that you have this, uh, second foreign language, um, <laughs> uh, schooling system in general, it is a con compulsory government funded education, uh, and actually, uh, education is compulsory until you're 16. And it's divided into uh, Bonneheu or kindergarten, which you attend when you're between three and five years old, uh, which is not typically an American kindergarten, but which is sort of this uh, uh, place where kids can uh, come and be exposed to a variety of experiences that will sort of count as a form of education. Um, so, uh, that could be a variety of activities like uh, like painting and, and gardening and and swimming and, and all these different things sort of for kids to just experience the world. Uh, no kid is is put in a classroom <laughs> in in kindergarten in Denmark. Uh, and Falke School is sort of our uh, mandatory schooling, which is uh, from zero to ninth grade, uh, which is 10 years of mandatory schooling. Uh, where people, where kids will be in a classroom and they'll learn sort of the basic schooling things. Uh, and after ninth grade, you'll walk away with a Danish schooling exam that'll essentially say that you've, uh, you've, <laughs> you've graduated your schooling. And, and that's sort of where our mandatory education ends. When you have graduated ninth grade, you can choose to either just simply work uh, or you can choose a gap year, or you can choose 10th grade, or to do 10th grade, or you can choose uh, sort of a gymnasium, which is our version of high school. Um, so there are a lot of different options after that. And you can also choose uh, various different uh, uh, other schools. Like if you wanna be a plumber, you can go to plumber school. Um, so there are a lot of different options after you sort of graduate ninth grade um, that kids have so that they're not stuck in a schooling system for too long. Um, and, but if you want to go to university and sort of do something that's academically oriented, like be a teacher or, or study philosophy, <laughs> Uh, then you usually then you need to do uh, high school or gym gymnasium and approximately 80% of the Danish population uh, decide to do that. Um, and then after that, you can sort of choose uh, either to go back to those other 
schools that you could have just entered when you were done with ninth grade, or you can choose to attend a university or, or whatever else you might be interested in. Um, all schooling is free in Denmark, even the universities. Uh, actually, you're paid to go to school when you are 18 and above. Uh, the state will sort of grant you uh, a monthly payment because we consider schooling as a full-time job in Denmark. Uh, so that's really cool, very neat. Uh, boarding schools, uh, in terms of 10th grade, 10th grade is a voluntary grade that you can choose to do. So either you can just choose to do basically your ninth grade exam over again, or uh, what a lot of people do is that they uh, attend the Danish boarding schools. And uh, it's a huge cultural phenomenon in Denmark, these boarding schools. Sorry, someone said something in the chat. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, essentially there are these private schools uh, that are sort of based on the enlightenment period and so the whole point was to sort of uh, expose kids to uh, a more uh, individualistic and uh, adult experience. Uh, so kids will uh, go to school for a year and they will live there and be exposed to a variety of activities. Uh, and typically boarding schools will have certain uh, focuses. So some boarding schools might be very sports oriented, while others might uh, put a lot of importance on gymnastics or music and, and whatever else, um, which is really cool. So you can sort of choose what school fits you best. Um, and uh, however, there's been sort of a lot of political pressure in regards to these boarding schools, um, because they've sort of had uh, a tendency to want to streamline our education. Uh, recently, <laughs> and the boarding schools and this whole 10th grade idea sort of takes away from that. Um, but uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of social support in regards to boarding schools, so hopefully that doesn't change. Um, but there definitely has been a lot of political pressure to sort of take away some of those freedoms that boarding schools have, because they essentially have the freedom to uh, do whatever they want. <laughs> Um, with their their time and, and their students uh, to sort of lay out their own curriculum that's specific to them. Um, and you can see here some pictures actually from my boarding school experience because I went to boarding school. Uh, and uh, in 2017, when uh, Aarhus, which is a city in Denmark, <laughs> was named the uh, cultural midpoint of Europe or whatever. I'm not quite sure what it was called. Uh, we participated, my, my whole school participated in the big parade. Uh, and we had these boats with lights in them where we that we painted. And then we sort of was a part of this whole experience, which is really cool, you know, because it's something that we would not have been exposed to uh, otherwise. Um, uh, another really big cultural thing is the law of Jente in Denmark, which is um, this uh, sort of cultural mindset that we have. It's not a law, <laughs> uh, but it is um, sort of based on uh, the, I don't know, I don't know what you would call it, but sort of the cultural, uh, the underlying cultural norms of Denmark. Uh, and this this law, these law, and this list that you see on the screen was actually developed by uh, a Danish Norwegian author uh, in a satirical novel of his. And uh, the satirical novel was essentially supposed to make fun of uh, Danish cultures and Danish norms. And since then, it's sort of been, uh, you know, a uh, uh, a very open concept in Denmark that we talk about this uh, law of Jente, um, even though we don't see it written out like this a lot. So basically it says that, that you're not to think that you're anything special and you're not to think that you're as good as us and you're not to think that you're smarter than us and so on and so forth. So it's essentially sort of a way to promote the community instead of the individual. Um, and uh, 
and it sort of creates this sort of enclosed in environment in which everyone is is sort of humble i suppose <laughs> i guess that's the idea um but we obviously have become much more aware of this and sort of what it means for us culturally uh, but it's definitely still a big thing and you know the big question is is this ever a mindset that will really you know that will really change in denmark or or is it always going to be like this and how is it, it affecting us and they're very big questions we don't really know much about it but it is a huge sort of underlying uh culture in denmark that we generally think that we're not better than others and that we're not supposed to think that we're better than others um so that's very cool uh, another big cultural thing in denmark is hygge uh, which is sort of a word for the concept of coziness uh, so essentially you can describe anything that you that gives you warm fuzzy feelings and that makes you smile and that makes you happy and that makes you comfortable and that makes you feel in the right place at the right time you can call that hygge and you can do that alone or you can do that with others and uh it's really unfortunate that it's not really a concept that people in other countries and in, and in other languages they don't typically have a word for this um but we do and <laughs> we will call everything hygge or hygge um because it's sort of a good way to describe that feeling of being in a good place um and then a little bit about Danish art, because I think that's really interesting. Uh, we're really big on uh, sort of satire, uh, sort of like the French. Uh, so in Danish newspapers and whatnot, you'll see a lot of interesting satirical art about current political situations or or whatnot. Um, and specifically, this one that you see on the screen is sort of uh, making fun of the, the Denmark's um, uh immigration laws and and how tight they are <laughs> um and uh and it's sort of uh a car 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 caricature of a danish politician uh the woman and the picture and then but typically our art has gone through a lot of uh like our our actual cultural art has gone through a lot of uh different developments uh particularly following european uh, art history and culture um, but one really big thing that we did have in Denmark that sort of is culturally important in art is that we had this big movement um, of artists who uh, once again sort of focused on the beauty of Denmark and um, and that's sort of the two pictures that you can see here where uh, artists sort of went out into the Danish nature to to paint the people and and to paint the, the the Danish light and the Danish beauty, I suppose. <laughs> um, so so those are sort of the two big cultural things. But we don't really have anything that's particularly Danish because once again we sort of are, have a lot of international influences uh, and typically follow sort of the European history, of course with a lot of our own uh, specific developments that are specific to Denmark, but but otherwise it's you know very generic <laughs> in a sense. Um, and then you know if anybody has any questions, I thought I sort of wanted to show off Danish graduation when you graduate high school in Denmark. Uh, everybody dresses in white, and you know the Danish flags are raised, and people typically uh go out partying and and sort of you know uh people typically what's called um rent a, a big truck that you can see in this picture that that's that's our truck the truck our class rented together and they will go right around the city and they'll visit everybody's houses uh, and then everybody's parents will be there and serve cake and drinks and whatnot um and everybody will get extremely drunk, <laughs> uh, which is not something I participated in, but you know, sort of a part of the game, I suppose, for a lot of the, the Danish youth. And then our graduation caps are, are these guys that you can see in the picture. Uh, there are a lot of sort of variety 
of these depending on what uh, sort of high school education you do. Um, but this is sort of the generic one. And this is my graduation cap, very cool. <laughs> um, so if anybody has any questions about Denmark or, or about my experiences here or anything, feel free to ask. I have a question. Why do you wear white when you graduate? Is there like any reason to that or just what you guys do? Uh, I, uh, I think um, it's because Danish uh, schools typically were uh, sort of Christian education academic schools. I, I'm not quite sure what those are called. Um, and white is obviously sort of the, the color of innocence and whatnot. So mm -hmm. I think it's supposed to sort of represent that transition into uh, an academic adulthood. And it's also sort of a, a color of of class in a sense that you are that you have the ability to wear white. Uh, so I think that that's just carried over uh, from sort of that time when uh, going to these uh, gymnasiums or high schools were sort of uh, a, uh, a privileged privilege thing to do. And it was very connected to the church and whatnot. So. I loved your presentation, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Olivia, for sharing this great and rich information. For me, I was like, you know, a little bit about Denmark like from movie, the Viking and all these things. So thank you so much. Uh, Sydney, Swedish. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. I'm glad, no, it was informational. <laughs> yeah, you did a great job. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. And for our upcoming event, we have tomorrow, Power On, at the same time. Uh, it's, uh, we're gonna learn about how to manage um, uh, the stress since it's April, it's the Stress Awareness Month. So join us and follow us in our social media. And thank you, have a great night. Yeah, have a good night. Thank you for coming everybody. And this session will be uh, recorded and uh, we will upload it to the MSP YouTube channel. So you can share it with uh, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, actually I'll see if I can find a recipe right now here, if you want to, right now. I'll post in the chat. Oh, so I'm still the, sharing my screen. The, uh, the Danish or the Denmark pancake that you made it before, is it also traditional? Uh, uh, which one? The pancake you uh, did it Yeah, uh, so that's a, typically a traditional dessert that we eat around Christmas. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, here we go. <laughs> oh, I actually found the recipe that the picture comes from. That's cool. Uh, this, oh no, this one's in Danish though. That doesn't help. Wait. <laughs> uh, does, okay, here. Does your Google translate this? I don't know if your Google translates that. <laughs> oh, actually. Is there any option to change the language from the website? Because I can't understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here, I'll also post this one that's uh another th that one's uh in english yeah i think that one's good mm -hmm.
Yeah, no problem. <laughs> so what is it, the DL cream? Or what? I'm not sure, can't. Hmm? I'm reading the recipe and the ingredients. Oh. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for Have coming. Have a great night. You too. Bye. 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 <laughs> oh, you did a great job, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>